Good afternoon. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to this webinar organized by the Institute of International and European Affairs and the Embassy of Ireland in Brazil. My name is Juliana Del Bucarque. I'm an academic at University College Cork. My fields of interest are German and Jewish studies. And I'm, I'm currently uh, developing a research on shifting perceptions of Jewish identity in Brazil. I also write a fortnightly column for the newspaper Folha de São Paulo. We are delighted to be joined today by Dr. Robert Muga, co-founder of the Igarapé Institute in Brazil, who has been generous enough to take time out of his schedule to speak to us. Uh, Dr. Muga specializes in security, cities, climate action, and digital transformation. He co-founded the Igarapé Institute, a think tank and do tank focused on human, digital, and climate security. He also co-founded the SecDev Group, a data science company committed to detecting and deterring cyber threats and building digital resilience. Dr. Muga is also a senior advisor to McKinsey, a fellow at Princeton, the Graduate Institute Geneva, the Chicago Council on Glo Global Affairs, and is non-resident faculty at Singularity University. Dr. Muga also advises the World Economic Forum, Councils on the Future of City, its annual global risk report, and the global Parliament of Mayors. He earned a doctorate at the, from the University of Oxford. We are also delighted to be joined today by both Ambassador Marcel Fortuna Beato, Ambassador of Brazil to Ireland, and Ambassador Sean Hoy, Ambassador of Ireland to Brazil, who will provide remarks at the beginning and at the closing of this webinar. Ambassador Beato now will provide opening remarks. And following this, Dr. Muga will deliver a keynote speech to us for about 20 minutes. Then we'll go to Q&A. Uh, please use the Q&A uh, tool here on the Zoom call to send your questions and make sure to put your name in the questions and your affiliation so we, we know where the questions are coming from. Uh, finally, Ambassador Hoy will bring the webinar to a close uh, with a few remarks. And uh, I, I now formally hand uh, the microphone to Ambassador Beato. Ambassador Beato, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, Juliana. And thank you for your helpful remarks and uh, to the organizers from IEA for this uh, invitation. Uh, I enjoyed it, the invitation because I think it's a very timely initiative. Uh, this event provides an opportunity, I believe, for uh, an Irish audience to get better acquainted with recent uh, shocking events in Brazil, which have caught uh, international uh, attention. And maybe just as important because what has happened in Brazil is a challenge, not only for my country, but globally in its nature and its reach. So I'd like to make a few quick points. First is that we have, we underestimated the willingness, I think of radical extremists to use violence uh, to put their fringe ideas into practice in direct opposition to majority opinion. Uh, I was surprised by what happened. We luckily did not see any violence, but there is no room for complacency. The fact that there is uh, negligible support for extreme solutions cannot make us ignore the fact that Brazil and many other countries is, is politically polarized, which means that we have the duty and the responsibility to understand the motivation as well as the methods of these individuals. And this requires, I think, fundamentally distinguishing between dissatisfaction with institutions, which is rife and natural in any democracy, and the willingness to overthrow these institutions. I think there's a fundamental distinction that must guide our actions. My second point is that democracy prevailed, and I believe is stronger in Brazil as a result. Brazilian institutions have shown resilience. All government branches came together for a coordinated, largely seamless response. I, I believe institutions are only as strong as your ability to withstand threats. And this was showcased in the Brazilian case by the active rule of law, which was quickly restored without violence, all showing overwhelming support 
for democratic process and bringing those responsible to justice. And a full investigation now underway at, at, at different levels, both intelligence and justice. Third point is that I think this highlights uh, the wider question of the need to deal with threats against democracy, but obviously without jeopardizing democratic practices and institutions. It requires fundamentally, and I think this is what is happening in Brazil, applying laws consistently, transparently, and with accountability. In the case of Brazil, there is a fundamental issue here because the attacks involved uh, security personnel, even from uh, armed forces, as well as political activists and leaders. The issue has arisen in the fact that uh, there is now discussion about excluding from office recent uh, 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 politicians recently elected. And this is an important discussion which is now going on, I think, in, in a very uh, fruitful manner. I think it is fundamental that we recognize uh, the role of fake news. Fake news has legitimized through social media into democratic sentiments. The fact that fake news exploits real grievances doesn't make it less, less fake, just makes it more difficult to stamp out. How to regulate this? The crucial issue is to distinguish, I believe, between freedom of expression and hate speech or incitement to disobedience. This must be worked through the institutions and a, a obviously very complex debate. It's not easy, not obvious. Fourthly, I think Brazil appreciates the global solidarity that has been shown. We appreciate statements by President Higgins and Tanish de Martin. It helps counter the false narrative, not only in Brazil, but equally overseas. And this is a threat, as I said in the beginning, not just of Brazil, right-wing extremism, extremism has been rising. Even in Ireland, there's been talk of it. There was a recent article in the, in the Irish Times referring to the influence or negative influence of events in Brazil could have in Spain. There is a need for a global answer, common narrative that allows for mutually reinforcing and legitimizing policies through multilateral sanction and institutions. And that is something which I think must be at the top of our agenda. Lastly, uh, on a more uh, topical or bilateral note, I would say that the recent creation of the Irish Brazilian Parliamentary Friendship Group, just instituted, will provide a venue, an opportunity for these issues to be debated within, uh, among politicians, but, but with also other social actors in a way that helps us bilaterally also to take forward this agenda. So these are the main points I had. Thank you for the opportunity and I look forward to a very illuminating and productive debate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, Dr. Muga, please, uh, you can take the stage. Thanks so much uh, to the IIEA for, for this very kind invitation to participate in, in today's session. Uh, and as I wait for my colleague to put up the uh, PowerPoint, let me also offer my thanks to Ambassador Beato for, for really excellent opening observations. And of course, to Ambassador Hoy, who's going to uh, provide us with some thoughtful reflections at the end in advance. And thanks to you, Dr. Uh, de Albuquerque, for chairing the session. Um, and let me extend my final thanks to Ireland for, for its support to some of our work at the Institute on Digital Harm Reduction. Um, given the impressive, uh, indeed illustrious nature of this group, I'll do my best to keep my reflections uh, to a minimum. So let me turn to the next slide. By way of introduction, and I think as I was already mentioned, I'm one of the founders of the EGAFE Institute. We're a global think and do or global think and action tank working on uh, a range of different topics. Um, our focus is not just at the local scale in, in Brazil, but also regionally and globally. And our activities span uh, the Americas, Africa, Asia, uh, and Europe. One key point is the Institute is women led. Uh, so I am not necessarily a representative uh, example of the Institute. Um, and we work on a range of issues from gun control and drug policy to environment, crime, and cybersecurity. Next slide, please. I, I've been asked to reflect on some of the challenges facing Brazil today and into its future. This is no small task in uh, 25 going on 23 minutes. What I'm going to try to do, rather than taking them all on, uh, is really focus in on digital harms. And I'm going to focus on digital harms because I think they amplify a host of other risks facing Brazil, and indeed, as the ambassador mentioned, many other countries besides. In this very short presentation, I'll start with a simple explanation as to what I mean by digital harms. I'll then offer a few general reflections on how they're potentially impacting Brazil's democracy and democratic institutions. And to avoid being overly gloomy, 
I'll offer some examples of the ways in which Brazil is responding, which might, as the ambassador mentioned, serve as an example, not just for Brazil and the region, but other countries around the world. And that's because Brazil is a kind of laboratory for a set of issues that are being wrestled with from North America to the European Union, across Africa and Asia. And I think what happens in Brazil offers some insights into the opportunities and the challenges of disrupting digital harms, the limits of government and judicial overreach, the practical difficulties of managing social media platforms, debates over free speech and censorship, and much, much more. Next slide, please. When looking sort of into the, the near-term future, there's really no way to sugarcoat it. The incoming Lula administration faces a range of challenges in 2023, and these are just a few. Uh, we're, we're looking at multiple intersecting uh, risks across multiple sectors. We've got a deeply divided Congress. We have a sagging economy. We have high unemployment. We have food insecurity. We have what the makings and perpetuation of environmental crisis in the Amazon. And undergirding all of these difficulties is a hyper polarized society, one where both sides feel the other constitutes a kind of existential threat. And rather than try and fail to address all of these challenges, I'm going to focus on one particular subset that I think amplifies the others, and that's digital harms. Next slide, please. So what are these digital harms? And apologies for this large matrix. <laughs> one thing to say is that they're easier uh, described than defined. Very, very generically, they consist of a range of malicious online activities that run the gamut from digital divides to digital authoritarianism to digital surveillance all the way to cyber attacks disinformation misinformation and hate speech and like just about everywhere else on the planet brazil is facing multiple types of digital harms occurring simultaneously that are often reinforcing one another and at the institute we're focusing on all of them but for the purposes of this presentation i want to narrow the gaze to just disinformation and misinformation next slide Think of digital harms as the negative externalities of the digital commons, sort of the dark side of digital transformation. They are a byproduct of the internet, which as many of you know, wasn't designed with security or privacy in mind. Now there's no doubt that the spread of connectivity, digital devices and new platforms has transformed our politics, our economics, our social interactions. But along with these new efficiencies and economies of scale, they've also opened up a host of new threats and vulnerabilities. Digital harms and misinformation, uh, including dis disinformation and misinformation, aren't just a nuisance. They're potentially hugely damaging to our democracies and to our wider development. We saw this very clearly with COVID-related misinformation, which led to vaccine hesitancy and fed anti-vax movements, especially in places like Brazil and the US, which not coincidentally had the two highest death tolls. We're seeing it with climate disinformation, sowing skepticism and doubt, uh, undermining the green transition, again, affecting Brazil and the U.S. when it comes to domestic policy. We're seeing with attacks against our democratic institutions and our elections, including undermining faith and trust in the systems of governance. Next slide, please. Of course, we need to be quite careful about overattribution. There are many factors that are contributing to what many describe as a 15-year low faith in democracy in Brazil and Latin America. As you can see here, Brazil is somewhere in the pack when it comes to support for democracy as of 2021. But this is down from highs in the 70s to 80 percentage uh, in the 1990s and 2000s. Now, there are many explanations for the overall downward trend in support for democracy. There's frustration with political elites, who many feel are failing to deliver. There's the persistent and nagging inequality and low wages and unemployment that affect large parts of Latin America. There's a low economic growth, high rates of inflation, there's the corruption and crime and victimization, all of which tend to be proportionally higher. But some social scientists are starting to document the ways in which digital harms, such as misinformation, disinformation, can amplify existing discontent, sharpen biases, and shift behavior. Next slide, please. Digital harms are especially corrosive for democracy when they're leveraged by political leaders to target the very legitimacy and integrity of electoral processes and democratic institutions. They don't just reduce support for democracy, but they also reinforce and intensify anti-democratic sentiment. As you can see here, over 30% of Brazilians claim to be dissatisfied with democracy in 2021, which is an increase, as I mentioned, on previous years. And this can help explain, in some ways, why we're seeing rising support for alternative forms of governance, including more autocratic and authoritarian ones in Brazil and around the world. Next slide, please. A more extreme effect of digital harms is to intensify support for non-democratic transitions of power, something the ambassador uh, Beato alluded to. As we saw in the US on January 6th, 
digital harms can supercharge protest movements and empower those extreme and hateful voices, including those opposed to democratic forms of government. We've witnessed this in recent years in Brazil, including a deepening tolerance for the pushing of the boundaries of democratic norms in the event of dissatisfaction with elected leaders. Brazil was already vulnerable, of course, with just under 40% of the population saying that coups were acceptable in certain conditions and circumstances of extreme and egregious abuse of power. While, of course, many factors are at play, the spread of disinformation and proliferation of conspiracies and rising acceptance of non-democratic solutions culminated in some ways with the January 8th insurrection. The point is that disinformation channeled by a tiny handful of influencers and bots can mobilize relatively large factions of partisans with devastating effect. Next slide, please. As you might expect, trust in democracy and the electoral process is also correlated with demographic factors. It seems that younger people across Latin America are typically less trustful, uh, comparatively speaking, of democratic norms than older generations. We see here that with just 38% of young people, Latin Americans, young Latin Americans between 1825 trusting elections as compared to 53% uh, among seniors. Of course, there are variations from country to country. In Brazil, Brazil, for example, it was not always the case that it was younger people who were less, more suspicious of democracy. In fact, older generations were fed a steady diet of disinformation, and in some cases were as suspicious of the electoral process as anybody else. Trust, next slide, please. There's also growing evidence that the relentless spread of digital harms is damaging for fundamental democratic processes such as elections. To some extent, we could say that disinformation and misinformation are banging on an open door in parts of the Americas. In Brazil, just 33% of the population expressed trust in elections in 2021, one of the lowest proportional shares in the entire region. What that means is that attacks on the integrity of the electoral system, from election polls to voting machines, they kind of resonate. And this is an insight that is being picked up not just by influencers on the far right domestically, but also non-democratic regimes from Russia to China and Iran. Next slide. So back to Brazil. Of course, digital harms didn't just spontaneously emerge during the elections of 2022. Digital harms like disinformation and cybercrime have been around in Brazil and elsewhere as long as there's been the internet. But they really, I would argue, burst on the scene in Brazil about a decade ago, particularly between May and July 2013. Many of you might recall that Brazil was racked by the largest single mass protests since the pro-democracy marches of the 1980s in 2013. Brazilians flooded the streets, angered by a slew of economic issues, initially catalyzed by a minor increase in bus fares. But these protests metastasized into demonstrations against everything from poor services to systemic corruption, particularly but not exclusively targeting the Workers' Party or PT. Next slide, please. One network that was quick to master social media-enabled protest was a group or a set of actors known notionally as the Black Bloc. This isn't actually a particular group, per se. It's actually a set of memes or tactics that were spawned in Germany in the 1970s and 80s, but that tend to target symbols of globalization. We saw small groups organizing online, and this is work that we did at Igarape back in 2013, often targeted by the police and expanding their support by taping and sharing these targeted abuses online. Another digital network that expanded its influence during the period was Anonymous, who also surged their activities online, a genuinely global movement with, with local chapters. So the internet and social media facilitated both legitimate and violent protests. But 2013, one could argue, was one of the first instances of a mass spread of disinformation and misinformation in Brazil. Next slide, please. The scope, scale, and intensity of digital harm started to industrialize from about 2017 onward. There was a, a considerable increase in the lead up to the 2018 presidential elections, energized by support for the far right and deep anti-PT sentiment. Now, hyper-partisanship and disinformation are very dangerous bedmates, and researchers started seeing the use of inorganic techniques to spread digital harms, tools that many of us now call bots. What you see here is not a painting by Miro. Instead, it represents the formation of distinct communities fed news from a small number of human and automated accounts. And as hyper-partisan channels and networks grew, they started changing the conversation into more extreme and divided communities. Hyperpartisan outlets, including channels managed by the former president and his family, were dramatically increasing the spread of fake news and biased information, presented alternatively as truth telling. We saw this again and again, including during the municipal elections of 2020, and of course, it reached new heights during and after the 2022 presidential campaign, as we shall see. Next slide, please. Digital harm scaled up at least in part because the country's national politics have shifted harder to the right 
particularly since 2018. There's ample evidence in several ongoing investigations into how the previous administration used digital platforms to spread disinformation and discredit opposition uh, actors, from politicians to journalists to scholars. Some critics described some of these behaviors as denoting a sort of techno-authoritarianism in the way that it erodes democratic norms and supercharges executive power. That's not to say that the left was not involved in spreading digital harms. They did. But as we're going to see, they were significantly outperformed by the far right. Next slide, please. Another structural reason for the expansion of these digital harms in Brazil and other parts of the world, frankly, is that the digital ecosystem there is also changing quite radically. Brazilians are, and if you spend time here, you will know that, nothing if not avid users, producers, and consumers of digital content. There are over 145 million regular social media users in this country of roughly 216 million, about two thirds of the population. Brazil is one of the world's top markets for Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, as well as encrypted platforms like WhatsApp, Telegram, and Signal. Many of these social media platforms, they simply don't apply the same level of scrutiny, oversight, and controls on content moderation in Brazil as they do, say, in the European Union or the United States for a variety of, I think, quite obvious reasons. In fact, researchers and activists here in Brazil have routinely bypassed content controls to place election-related disinformation directly onto platforms. In a highly polarized environment, this is incredibly dangerous. So to understand these dynamics and with support from Ireland, we partnered with a group called Democracy in Cheque and the TSE, the Tribunal for Elector Elections here, uh, and particularly its observatory for uh, transparent elections, to figure out how digital harms were degrading democracy in Brazil. So let me run through a couple of our findings. Next slide, please. The first uh, point, I suppose, and I just underline what I've already said, is that Brazilians are very significant users of Facebook. They're, in fact, the third largest market for Facebook in the world. And they are the principal way in which many people, especially in the lower income categories, get their primary news. And part of the reason for that is, is that Facebook came fairly early to Brazil, but it's also because it's cheaper to communicate on social media often than it is to communicate by telephone. Not surprisingly, Facebook continues to play a very outsized role in determining how people engage and think about elections, select candidates, and decide to vote. So when we looked at the volumetric metrics of political content, what we found was the far right was not necessarily producing more posts in Facebook, as you see on the left side of your column, but they were certainly getting a lot more engagement, as you see on the right column, in terms of engagement with their posts. They outpace not just the left, but the center and conventional media during the months leading up to and during and after the election. This is a trend we're going to see repeated uh, across multiple platforms. Next slide, please. Instagram is, is also wildly popular in Brazil, especially amongst young people. Uh, and again, what we see here is the Brazilian left actually consistently posting more content than the right uh, between August and December. But as in the case of Facebook, generating less engagement than the far right in virtually every single month, with the exception of September. What this means is the far right is not just more effective, they're more efficient in getting their material out to users. Next slide, please. For me, at least, one of the most staggering results was on YouTube, a wildly, pop, plat, wildly popular platform here in Brazil. And what you see here is that the far right were far more potent in both posting and gaining interaction through automated and, and human means. What you see here is they generated three times more views than all of the left, center, and conventional uh, audiences combined. The y-axis on the right-hand side here is the most important. You can see they generated over 2 billion views over a five-month period. Obviously, not all of this content is digital harm, per se. There's, of course, legitimate news, there's opinion, there's sharing of ideas. But the point is, is that the more content and interaction there is, the more potential there is for exposure to fake news, conspiracy, and lies. Next slide, please. And this is where we focus next. As part of our research that was supported by Ireland, we focused our analysis on four dominant disinformation narratives. These are general categories in which we group multiple types of fake news, conspiracy, and lies. We focused on narratives seeking to reduce trust in elections, narratives targeting democratic institutions, narratives discrediting and di diminishing the influence of opponents, and narratives seeking to influence mo supporters to mobilize take action on false pretenses. And we further divided these four narratives into over 20 sub-narratives for classification purposes. And then we subjected this to uh, some of our analysis online. And with Democracy in Cheque, we focused on eight different platforms, including the ones I just mentioned, as well as TikTok, Twitter, WhatsApp, Telegram, and Quay, a, a local platform here in Brazil. And each week we produced bulletins that we sent to Ireland, but also to the TSC and the STF, the Supreme Court uh, here in Brazil. We focused on the August to October period, since this was essentially the election campaign. Brazil has a mercifully short election uh, campaign cycle, uh, which usually typically begins in September. Next slide, please. 
So when we disaggregate the narratives, these four narratives, cumulatively, what we found is there's a fairly even distribution. Um, and I'm going to show you now as a representative sample of narratives to give you a sense of their form and content. But what we found generally is that the narrative seeking to reduce trust in the electoral institutions, particularly going after voting machines and going after electoral processes, tended to be the most dominant, what you see in green. This in some way makes sense, as I mentioned, given the low, relatively low levels of trust in elections that I noted earlier. Next slide, please. Disinformation narratives were also quite persistent across the four months of interest that we looked at. As you can see, the targeting of electoral institutions was generally the most popular narrative, and we saw significant growth in all forms of disinformation uh, between the first and second round of the elections on October 2nd and October 30th, and these are the yellow bars. The high volume and rapid expansion of disinformation often overwhelmed the institutions and platforms working to remove offending content and came under extraordinarily heavy criticism, which created a kind of negative cycle. As people complained about the lack of action, this too resulted in more spreading of disinformation, which uh, continued this vicious cycle. Next slide, please. As I mentioned, we organized our monitoring of disinformation across more than 20 sub-narratives. In the interest of time and your attention span, I'll focus on just some of the top level findings. Let's start with the sub-narratives uh, falling under electoral institutions. The most common targets we detected were against the TSE, the electoral, the, the tribunal uh, for, for the elections, uh, against election machines per se, as well as uh, disinformation targeting Supreme Court Justice Alexander Marais. These tended to grow over the election period, often in response to decisions made by the TSC or fake revelations of impropriety. Next slide, please. When it comes to the sub-narrative of Demo or the narrative of democratic institutions, uh, the key targets were the judiciary as a whole, often accused of being biased or favoring the left, as well as the Supreme Court specifically. These attacks are consistent with similar narratives over the previous four years that targeted the SDF. Next slide, please. When it comes to political opponents, we see not just the far left or far right, but also the left using these kinds of attack, attacks and tar uh, tactics to target their, their nemeses. Many narratives on the left sought to discredit Bolsonaro and his allies, accusing them of everything from fascism to corruption and genocide. The far right, though, were far more active in spreading disinformation targeting opponents, including not just candidates, but also the media uh, as well as activists, often accusing Lula of everything from authoritarianism to drug trafficking, Satanism, pedophilia, and, and much, much more. Many of these accusations, this is a point we might want to pick up in the discussion period, echo some of the slurs that we see in the United States with MAGA and QAnon supporters. And that's not coincidental either. Next slide, please. Finally, when it comes to narratives seeking to influence supporters under false pretenses, uh, we saw a fair bit of disinformation used to sway supporters. Some of these were cast uh, as an existential struggle of good versus evil. They threatened the, the supporters, uh, often seeking to support their supporters by threatening uh, risks that Lula might introduce communism, impose dictatorships, suppress religious freedoms, and spread gender-based uh, and gender and identity-based ideologies across primary schools. So we saw the weaponization, effectively, of culture wars uh, used to prominent effect by the far right in particular. Next slide, please. So what are some of the big takeaway messages from all of this? First, and I think this is fairly obvious from some of these images, is that the far right vastly outperformed the left, center, and conventional media in the spreading of uh, both content, but also disinformation. The second is that the target has often been electoral institutions themselves. A third big finding is we saw digital harms accompanied with escalating violence against opposition candidates, independent media, and civil society on the street. And fourth, as we shall see, Key institutions were, were, were reasonably successful in pushing back a point that the ambassador made at the outset. So why is this important? I think understanding the nuances in narratives can help craft strategies to prevent and disrupt the spread of digital harms. Next slide, we're coming to the end. So let me conclude uh, on a slightly less gloomy note, describing some of the ways that Brazil has responded to these digital harms, including disinformation and misinformation. Government efforts obviously precede the 2022 elections. They also precede the 2018 elections. In fact, you have to go back almost a decade to see where Brazil starts engaging with many of these fundamental questions in a serious way. Arguably the most important first step was a piece of legislation, a digital bill of rights known as Marco Civil, that was conceived in 2009 and passed in 2014 in the wake of the Snowden revelations. It's a powerful expression of internet governance that echoed around the world that enshrined rights to freedom of expression, association, privacy, accessibility, freedom of information and access for development online. 
Marco Seville also set in motion a series of other legislative processes. Examples include the General Data Protection Law, which actually unifies 40 separate laws to protect data and individual rights. Another is the Fake News Bill in 2020 that's actually undergone multiple modifications and is yet to pass. Another one is the Brazilian AI Bill, which started being negotiated in 2020 and passed 21. These legislative efforts are, of course, not without their critics. They are being hotly debated in Brazil, as they should be. Very generally, some on the right see any form of content restrictions and moderation as unjustified censorship and constraining freedom of expression. Meanwhile, those on the left tend to believe these platforms should expand their moderation policies, especially with respect to countering digital harms. To wit, in 2021, Bolsonaro unsuccessfully tried to push through a bill that would require social media companies to limit moderation of content, an explicit challenge to the fake news bill. The bill didn't pass. Next slide, please. Over the past few years, we've seen Brazilian institutions, particularly the judiciary, uh, but as the ambassador mentioned, across the three powers, pushing back in many ways against digital harms, including disinformation and misinformation. One reason one could argue for this rather exuberant pushback is not just its destructive impact, but also the fact that the Supreme Court itself has been the object of many attacks. But it underlines, and I would agree with the ambassador, the resilience of Brazilian institutions, and I think sends an important message to governments around the world about how to react. There are many, many examples. I don't have the time today uh, to go through all of them, but here are just a couple uh, of examples of ways in which different modalities and mechanisms were created uh, by Brazilian authorities to address some of these challenges. We have the program to combat disinformation set up in 2019. Uh, actually launched in 2020 during the municipal elections to help people identify and verify information and unified more than 50 public and private entities together in a joined up effort. We have the permanent program to combat disinformation set up in 2021, uh, launched by the TSC that brought together 150 partners, including all eight major social media platforms to sign an agreement to fight election related disinformation. We have an election transparency commission set up again by the TSC tasked with improving electoral security, increasing transparency, and encouraging the participation of specialist public institutions, and importantly, civil society in monitoring elections. We have the Observatory of Election Transparency, set up by also by the TSC, of which the Gatape Institute is a part, along with many other organizations, committed to improving transparency and deepening knowledge about the Brazilian voting system and safeguarding democratic integrity. Uh, and it goes on. There are a whole series, and most recently, uh, as of 2023, uh, we have the new Department for the Defense of Democracy, created by presidential decree and set up by the Attorney General's office, which essentially bans disinformation and other content that promotes attacks against public powers. Not surprising, this and other efforts, especially the AGU department, are sparking fierce debates in Brazil. There are concerns, legitimate concerns, about government overreach, as well as censorship from opponents uh, on the far right and the right, as well as amongst digital activists. Um, we can say that all of these measures are still very much work in progress, but I think as the ambassador mentioned, in a robust democracy, uh, this kind of dialogue and, and, and discussion is, is absolutely critical. Final, I'll end simply by saying, digital harms cannot be prevented and reduced through digital means alone. Uh, for sure, it will require more engagement from the executive, judiciary, and legislature. At a minimum, we're gonna need more accountability from platforms, which of course implies more regulation. But more fundamentally, reducing digital harms such as disinformation and misinformation requires addressing underlying polarization and the structural factors that are driving it, from economic inequality uh, to social equity issues and so much more. What is more, tackling these digital harms is gonna require a step change level of engagement in awareness building, in education, in inoculation strategies. And here I think the experiences of other countries, including Finland, uh, are extraordinarily relevant. There's no doubt that Brazil's political system has been degraded by profound polarization after 2013, and particularly in the period of 2018 to 2022. Brazil is very much in a vulnerable moment. I think now is the time, as was mentioned by the ambassador, to revitalize pro-democracy alliances, including parties from the center-right, the center, the center-left, to safeguard democratic institutions. And international support will be key, including locking Brazil into key democratic processes and institutions. So with that, I'll end and hand back over to the chair uh, to continue the conversation. Thank you very much, Dr. Muga, for your presentation. Uh, we, we now have some questions for you, and I'd like to start with one of my own. Uh, 
uh, if I'm allowed to. So uh, I, I understand that the health of a liberal democracy depends quite often uh, on the, the level of education of a society of its citizens because citizens must know rules and debate them and you know participate in the functioning of a, of the, the the rules themselves the making of the rules themselves so what do you think is the connection between the level of education of brazilian society and its vulnerability to digital harms uh, do you see a relation in that, a dangerous relation between these two things? I think one of the lessons we're seeing across uh, Europe, across North America, and, and of course in Brazil, is that all societies, uh, whether experiencing high levels of tertiary and secondary education or not, are subjected to risks and threats of digital harm. So I, I'm not entirely convinced that it's a function of alphabetization or 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 even necessarily of awareness of democracy and the rules of the game it's particularly i think what's really fundamentally changed however as was mentioned earlier is that the the digital environment in which people are operating especially new generations of people who are reared and raised on uh, digital products and digital connectivity and digital platforms and spend an inordinate amount of time means that we need to get much savvier and smarter about our own practices of engaging with content that's online in a way that's critical. Just as we were taught as young people, those of us who were born before the internet, uh, in a world to be critical of what we read uh, in the newspapers and not to treat everything as fact, um, we also need to be increasing our digital literacy with engaging on online content in a much more profound fashion. And I think the speed and pace and scale of digital transformation that's been taking place, including in Brazil, I mean, literally in a generation, we have a transformation of society where there's more mobile phones per individual, where two thirds of the population are engaging uh, for more than six to seven hours a day online, uh, that we need a, a commensurate effort to start educating and building a kind of resilience, tolerance, a, 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 and a critical thinking towards content online. And so, you know, this is easier said than done. I, I think often we've looked at this as sort of punctual interventions. Let's focus on those who are more likely to be radicalized, or let's focus on those who are uh, uh, more susceptible for X, X, Y, and Z reasons. But what we need to start thinking about is how do we integrate this kind of education into our primary education systems, into our secondary education systems, into our universities? How do we start taking what's content online and subjecting it to the same level of critical scrutiny? Now, that's part of the demand side. Um, we also need to get much savvier and smarter about the supply side in terms of the nature of how content's distributed, what counts, what isn't. And that's where the regulatory stuff comes in. And a lot of the solutions that are being introduced in Brazil, I think, emphasize supply side constraints. But I think here's where I think Finland really does stand out. Finland uh, comes out number one in a ranking of over 40 countries in Europe, um, according to Open Society Institute, in terms of its digital resilience. And one of the reasons for that is that Finland, in addition to having a very strong and robust education system that's lauded all around the world, um, also has introduced, for at least the last decade, education in schools, including in elementary schools, uh, bringing in content online rather than ignoring it, and having young people engage with it, challenge it, scrutinize the integrity of it, on, reflect on its origins, talk about what it means and what the biases might be inherent in it, like we used to do with newspapers, which sadly have been obliterated uh, in the course of this digital transformation. So, so I think that we need to start looking not just the supply side on the regulatory front, which is no doubt important, and, and we're going to have to get more sophisticated and, and, and uh, more intelligent about our solutions, but also start reflecting harder on the demand side around awareness education, um, what some people call inoculation, creating strategies for critical thinking uh, to engage with content. Um, and much like a virus, to be able to treat it, understand the pathogen, uh, and treat it uh, appropriately. Thank you very much. Uh, we have a question here from Dare Lolor, uh, Senior Research at the IIEA. Uh, he asks, to what extent do you feel the spread of disinformation was organized or coordinated, such as by far-right groups acting in a coordinated manner to propagate this information? And secondly, did you see evidence of foreign interference in Brazilian elections? 
Great questions. Um, absolutely. I think on the first question, in terms of organization, uh, th there is no doubt that there was a high level of, of organization and coordination around not just the messaging and the content of messages, but in the strategies, tactics, and methods uh, deployed uh, by actors to, to, to spread information. Um, there is an ongoing investigation uh, into the Bolsonaro family, uh, notably one of his sons, who was alleged to be involved in a uh, so-called hate cabinet, which was a, a group coordinating online to be able to send out mass messages, often uh, including disinformation and misinformation and other forms of hate speech uh, that would circulate not just on the public facing side of the net, that's to say Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or TikTok, but also more importantly on the uh, encrypted messaging platforms like WhatsApp uh, and, and most recently Telegram. Um, and so there is an an abundance, I think, of evidence and information that's circulating, suggesting that a relatively small group of, uh, let's call it far-right uh, politicians, of influencers who also uh, were sympathetic to the far-right, uh, uh, as well as automated accounts, um, which have surged in Brazil over the last couple of years, uh, that were seeking to mobilize um, information. And I think this in a way, uh, deepened during the, the COVID pandemic uh, period as well. Many people were left uh, in isolation, often had only their phones with which to engage with the outside world. Uh, and across Brazil, if you speak with families, uh, many uh, have experienced great fractions and, and, and ruptures as a result of um, sort of parts of families drifting to one side uh, or the other. And it's created a, an enormous amount of pain and, and I think suffering in addition to political polarization, which has shaped the elections. So there's there's absolutely evidence um, of a relatively small group. And I think in, in a lot of our work, we're able to identify and pinpoint who are those so-called super spreaders um, that have been disproportionately involved in, in, in shaping the information space. Uh, one additional point to mention is that, and I've alluded to this earlier in the presentation, is that some of these tactics and methods were borrowed uh, really quite literally uh, out of the Trump playbook. Um, there's, again, widely available information and evidence uh, indicating the relationships between many in the Trump camp, notably Steve Bannon and James Miller uh, and others, as well as those in the Bolsonaro camp, including one of Bolsonaro's sons, Eduardo, uh, in discussing methods and methodologies and ways of uh, spreading information and certain kinds of messages that land well. And so it was very interesting in, in doing some of this research, not just over the election period, but but also before, to see the arrival of made in USA uh, memes uh, that really didn't make a lot of sense in the Brazilian context, but that were somehow Brazilianized, uh, transformed uh, and, and, and spreading um, so as to agitate uh, individuals. So in a way, Brazil became both a laboratory for testing out new memes, as well as a, a, a landscape or an ecosystem in which these memes were being uh, distributed. Thank you very much. Uh, we have another question uh, by Shimas Allen, IIEA digital policy researcher. And he asks, what parallels are there between disinformation campaign, the disinformation campaign of Bolsonaro and between disinformation campaigns used by the Brazilian military regime as a tool of social control between the 1960s and 1980s? Do you see some parallel between those? I I could. I haven't. It's a great question. I haven't looked um, mm -hmm. in detail at the the kind of um, uh, propaganda that was uh, being used during the the 64 to 85 in in Brazil uh, to sway people in one way or another. But I think a couple of parallels are there. I think for sure we have the good versus evil narrative, um, and and often positioned as the sort of the good nationalists against the dangerous communists. Um, and, and, and that was very much uh, over de rigueur in the 1960s and 70s with the, uh, during the military uh, uh, regime um, in, in uh, seeking to position large segments of the society against the infection or the cancer that is communism and socialism in Brazil. And I think we see a lot of that same rhetoric um, emerging under the previous administration. Um, using and leveraging these kinds of narratives and memes as a way of uh, pitting good versus evil. I think that the, similar to that is the sort of conservative family values debate, you know, um, discussions as well as the good Christian um, model. And I, again, I think during the 1960s and 70s and 80s, 
uh, there's perhaps more of an emphasis on traditional values and this idea of, of strong family units and uh, movement against de deviancy writ large, including from the left and the artistic communities. Uh, and I think we saw that again reinforced in a lot of the disinformation, misinformation uh, put out during the, the most recent campaign, as well as in 2018. Um, so there, there are definitely echoes, and, and those echoes maybe are not that surprising, given that, as everyone knows, Bolsonaro himself uh, was once an army captain, and uh, many of those within his inner circle uh, that were brought in were also um, some of either connected to the military reserve or police, or themselves have been uh, connected to the previous uh, administrations going back uh, at least a generation or more. So it's not that surprising that those tropes and those ideas were, were also reflected um, in in contemporary uh, disinformation campaigns and perhaps have some resonance with the past. But I'd be, I'd be curious to hear more from our colleagues uh, who are also on the panel about that. That's excellent. There's also like the, the religious content of the discourse that, that was very present throughout uh, the elections and then throughout Bolsonaro's government. You mentioned the good versus evil tactics, right? Uh, and uh, But we see as well like a shift between what this good versus evil mean from a society that was predominantly Catholic to a society that's now increasingly becoming more... Pentecostal, uh, so to speak. Uh, uh, there is a question here by Kian Fitzgerald, the IIEA foreign policy researcher, and he asks, to what extent could far-right penetration on the state security services linger in Brazil? And could this now pose a long-term threat to Brazil's political stability? In your estimation, is Brazilian defensive democracy capable of tackling far-right penetration in state organizations? It's an excellent question and a, and a very challenging one. Um, I mean, this was, for lack of a better expression, one of the most um, militarized governments in, in the democratic era. I mean, you had over a thousand uh, military and or reserve um, that were put into federal level civil, civic positions. Uh, you had thousands more who were involved at state uh, and municipal level, uh, either as politicians you had, or, or as, as civil servants. Um, you had a very high level of military, um, ex-military involved in cabinet level positions. Um, and, and you had a um, high level of interaction, as you might expect perhaps more than one might expect between the executive and, and military and policing institutions, notably the federal, uh, parts of the federal police, highway police, as well as, um, you know, connections with, with notionally connections with, with uh, state level uh, police as well. So, so we are talking about a very a fundamentally different kind of government um, in the previous administration than we've had um, since 80, 85. Uh, and there is a fair bit of evidence to suggest that there are um, some high levels of sympathies amongst parts of the military, uh, parts of the federal police, parts of um, some of the, the intelligence services, as well as certainly, uh, although they follow the governors, state level military police and civil police uh, for Bolsonarismo and, and many aspects of what Bolsonaro stood for. Um, and so amongst the most avid uh, consumers, in some cases, even producers of, of some of this information were those more militant and, and hardcore supporters uh, of the past administration. Uh, so there's undoubtedly a fair bit of residual uh, lingering frustrations, uh, anger and sympathies amongst uh, large conjurers. And we, we saw this in the lead up uh, to the election and during the election itself when parts of the federal police uh, were accused of having slowed, uh, potentially slowed the um, access of, of uh, voters to polling stations in areas that might have found, been more sympathetic to the PT. Uh, we've seen this most recently uh, with parts of the GSI, uh, service that supports the executive that uh, is uh, accused of having been perhaps um, uh, uh, not as <laughs> nearly as proactive as they should have been. And, in uh, preventing the events that led to the uh, January 8 uh, insurrection attempt. Um, we've seen it also in uh, state level police who fall under uh, governors who are more sympathetic to the previous administration. Um, and so I think 
there is no doubt that this is a, an enormous challenge. It's put civil military relations back on the table firmly and squarely in Brazil after a, a long period of time when many felt that many of these issues have been resolved. Um, and so I don't think that necessarily a coup threat is what we should be talking about, but we, we are talking about the role of the military as a subordinate authority uh, to the three powers and the the role that the uh, current government will have to remake in some ways or the relationship of the remake with these institutions. Um, President Lula has already taken some uh, fairly aggressive steps to start beginning to address uh, some of these lingering sympathies. Uh, there'll be a very concerted effort, I think, to replace many of those who've been appointed uh, from the military or reserve by Bolsonaro uh, in the upcoming uh, months. Um, there will be a concerted effort, I think, to maintain a, a dialogue and a positive and constructive dialogue uh, to, to, to manage some of these tensions and to keep them from overflowing. Um, but I think one of the big lessons of, of, of the last month or two is that even without Bolsonaro being in the country, uh, Bolsonarismo continues to be a force to be reckoned with um, in the same way that even with Trump out of power as president, uh, his uh, legacy and jurors and, and many of his supporters continue uh, to to uh, express great frustrations and, and, and reject, frankly, Biden as president, uh, while also um, pushing many of the agendas that that the previous you know, president had had supported. So this is not a problem that's going to go away. Um, it's an issue that I think is being very rapidly addressed. Um, I, I think Brazilian institutions are strong, um, and and there'll be an ability, I think, to, to tackle this. But it's it's going to, I think, be a major preoccupation for this administration. And and one of the challenges, I think, of, of these digital harms that have contributed to and um, lent support to the insurrection January eighth, is that this is going to be a significant focus of this administration at the expense of incredibly important issues um, to do with the economy, to do with social uh, development, to do with um, environmental justice and, and, and the fight against environment crime and getting to zero deforestation. So it's going to be a distraction, a necessary one, but it's going to be very front and center, I think, in, in, in the coming years for this term of uh, President Lula. Thank you, Dr. Muga. Now we have one last question uh, by Nora Owen, former Minister of Justice in Ireland. She asks, you have a very impressive menu of actions and laws available to defend democracy in Brazil. However, fear of retaliation often prevents complaint. Are there projections built in to protect individuals or groups who make a complaint about breaches of these laws? It's an interesting question. Um, I think one thing to stress about Brazil and Brazilian institutions in, in my decade plus of, of working here with colleagues uh, at the federal and state level is that especially since uh, sort of the, the, the 90s and, and, and really amplified the 2000s, there is a very strong commitment to participatory uh, democratic decision making and the involvement of civic actors um, in the formulation and oversight uh, of, of legislation and new initiatives. Uh, and so I think we've seen this also in the, um, despite the challenges of the last four years uh, in the development of institutions together with the TSC, uh, to try to bring in um, specifically the concerns and considerations of uh, civil society, including and even particularly minorities and 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 those who might um, be suffering disproportionately um, from the kinds of misinformation disinformation I've been describing. So, in that long list of uh, and and frankly, it's a short list, uh, but but in that relatively long list that I, I put up earlier at the end of the presentation, which signaled a few of the kinds of initiatives that are underway, uh, there very much has been built in uh, to those processes under the Supreme Court, under the TSC, uh, processes for redress, processes for uh, alert, processes for um, complaint and whistleblowing uh, to, to facilitate um, more popular and public engagement and participation in the fight against disinformation and misinformation. So I'm not saying it's perfect, but I am saying that there is this tradition um, of, of bringing in large segments of society uh, 
uh, to be actively involved in the propagation, promulgation, and ultimately the enforcement uh, of, of, of many of these kinds of uh, initiatives. Um, and I, like I said, we've seen this um, most recently in the case of, of disinformation. So I think we can expect more of this um, uh, in the current administration. Um, the previous administration went to some length to uh, take apart and dismantle um, many of these mechanisms for civic engagement, civic participation, precisely to address some of those concerns you're raising, Nora. Um, so I, I hope to see and expect to see more uh, in, in, the, in the coming four years. Thank you very much, Dr. Muga. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone who made questions here in the seminar. And I'd like to thank Dr. Muga again for his excellent talk and also Ambassador Beato for his opening remarks, which were very informative. And uh, I'd like now to ask uh, Ambassador Hoy to give his closing remarks for the seminar. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Albuquerque, and uh, to everybody who's been involved in today's event. Uh, oh. Sorry, can you see me now? Um, yes. So uh, just to thank, thank everybody that has been involved uh, today in the event. Um, I'm based here in Brasilia. I was here um, on the 8th of January and I think just to follow on from the remarks by Dr. Biaccio, our view is that um, the institutions have certainly been tested, but they've held strong. And that, you know, within Europe and within Ireland in particular, it was very important for us to express our solidarity. And as noted, the Tanishta was one of the first uh, to use social media in a positive way to, re to reinforce our solidarity with Brazil. And um, last week we had Vice President Timmermans from the European Union visit here to do exactly the, that. And this week the Chancellor of Germany is here in Brasilia and uh, there are many others coming in and Ireland fully supports these uh, visits. And uh, we're also uh, very welcoming of the fact that President Lula will, will travel to Europe and engage with us. I just, I just wanna make one or two comments just on the importance of Brazil and the importance of Brazil re-engaging uh, with the world. Because uh, in 2024, Brazil is going to chair the G20. And we're at a time where the world is polarized. So we've, we've talked a lot today about polarization within countries. But the role of Brazil and President Lula as the chair of the G20 is very important. And in 2025, Brazil will chair the BRICS. And this could become a, a much more important group as this involves Brazil, Russia, and China, and as we know, India and South Africa. So th these are um, these are very important um, realities, and they give a uh, real context to our engagement here. We also have 70,000 Brazilians living in Ireland, and their views are on social media, and they do inform our engagement here, and I believe that is very positive. Um, but, um, I think we have to accept that Brazil is 100 times bigger than Ireland and that um, our role is to support Brazil, to recognize the, um, the institutions and to, and to support them where they're working. And you know, tomorrow I've been invited to the reopening of the Supreme Court, which was one of those uh, institutions that was attacked on the 8th of January. And I believe we will all be there in, in large numbers. This is a part of the world that Ireland is focusing more strongly on than we have in the past. In 2022, we um, launched our first ever Latin American Caribbean strategy. And that, you know, this gives us a real agenda to engage. And that Brazil, which is 50% of the land mass of South America, is a very important part of that. Uh, later this year, we'll have the first ever Latin America Ireland Business Forum, and that will include uh, high level visits we hope from governments in uh, South America, Latin America, the Caribbean and business as well. So I think I'd like to, you know, end this uh, engagement on a positive note. Um, this exchange has been very helpful. It helps us understand the context better and that I hope uh, helps us to in, become more effective partners.
Ambassador Biaccio and I talk regularly, and uh, this agenda will only help us engage in further issues. But I'd like to, you know, I'd like to thank the IIEA, to Barry, Kean, and Lorcan in particular, uh, Dr. Robert Muga. I'd like to thank you, Dr. Juliana, uh, for chairing this session, and uh, Ambassador Biaccio for the opening remarks, and uh, the contribution made by our consulates in Sao Paulo, Owen and Rachel, because they made the initial contact with the Garapé. We've had a good outline of the result of that project, and uh, everybody has had a, a very meaningful role, and I hope we all finish today a little more educated and with the ability to ask more relevant questions, I think. So thank you all very much. Muito obrigado. Thank you.